Okay, so this is a guide to bike touring the Dalton Highway in Alaska, also known as the Hall Road. The Dalton Highway is 414 miles long, mostly dirt, but also has some sections that are paved and seal coated, so it alternates. The highway starts off of the Elliott Highway north of Fairbanks and leads all the way to the Arctic Ocean to the oil field known as Prudhoe Bay Dead Horse. Along the way, you have the chance to see some amazing wildlife, unbelievable weather and seasonal changes, the rugged Brooks Range, and you'll also see lots and lots of trucks. I guess I'll start a list of five things to have in mind before going on the Dalton Highway. One are the logistics of this trip. I just want to make sure you know before you go on this road that this is one of the most remote roads in the world. You're in the middle of nowhere. Let me repeat, you're in the middle of nowhere. So you have to be extremely self-sufficient. You have to be able to endure a night or two in the elements if you get stranded. And you just have to come into the experience with the mindset that you're very self-reliant out there. Now, with that being said, there are a few options with regards to riding this road. You could ride this road both ways, which practically no one does. Or you could ride the road one way, either north to south or south to north. The closest major airport is Fairbanks. And from there, you could fly up to Prudhoe Bay. There's a charter bus, I believe, that takes you from Fairbanks up to Prudhoe Bay. Uh, I believe it's about $250 or $300 and about a 15-hour ride. And then lastly, the option that I opted for was hitchhiking, which obviously was the cheapest. I received a total of four rides in order to get from Fairbanks to the Arctic Ocean, and I rode my bike about 100 miles going north just to connect to better places to hitchhike from. Every hitchhiking experience was great. I wouldn't recommend hitchhiking in Los Angeles or Houston or New York, but up there there's just the understanding that people are there for an adventure. So you're probably not going to get murdered. But of course, use your discretion. Oh, and I will mention, you may have to wait a while. I ran into a guy named Doug who waited three days for a ride. I had to wait overnight one day. And just keep in mind, this is one of the loneliest roads in the world, and there's barely any traffic. In terms of logistics for food, there's only two places to get food along the highway's 414 miles. Firstly, at the Yukon River, and then secondly, at Coldfoot. And it isn't like there's a market or anything. You could buy a hamburger, some french fries, and that's about it. Coldfoot actually offers a really good buffet style meal. But once again, it's more of a restaurant than anything else. So you need to be able to carry your food for the entire 414 miles. One option that I took advantage of was mailing food up to Coldfoot. They have a little post office up there. But when I went there, the post office was only open on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So make sure to check what days it's open. I didn't realize that the post office was open only three days of the week, and I just lucked out by rolling in on a Friday afternoon. Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse have slightly more options. Once again, there's a buffet-style restaurant. This is at the Aurora Hotel, and there's also a general store, so you could get some candy bars, some protein bars, some pretty basic food items like milk, but not really anything backpacking-oriented. Except for the mail option at Coldfoot, there's really no way to resupply midway through riding this road. If you're looking for lodging along the road, good luck. You're going to be camping most nights. I will say though, and this goes for a lot of Alaska, if you have an opportunistic eye with regards to staying places, you can probably get by staying in an abandoned building or shed here and there. I stayed in a maintenance shed one night near Pump Station 3, and I also slept in the cab of a tractor another night. They don't lock a lot of doors in the Arctic. Also, they have at least three pit toilet bathrooms along the road, which I remember. They might have more. One was on the North Slope. One was on the edge of the Chandler Shelf. And the other was on Finger Mountain. I didn't stay in these, and I'm not recommending that you should. But if worse came to worse, if you're in a dire situation and you need some shelter, they're definitely an option better than being in the elements. And also, they're very clean. They don't get much traffic. I'll put the coordinates to the sheds and the bathrooms that I found in my bio. And I just want to mention one last thing about the logistics. The people that you meet on this road are adventurers. They understand why you're on the road. And most of them, if they see you're in trouble, they're willing to help. In addition to those four rides that I received hitchhiking, I received a meal of freshly cooked caribou from some hunters. 
water from at least four or five drivers that stopped to ask how I was doing, so many snacks from a Swiss couple that I couldn't even carry them, and maybe the best ham sandwich I've ever had given the circumstances. That was so nice of you to stop and give me some food. This guy is a real one right here. I love him. Secondly is the terrain of the Dalton Highway. You could divide up the Dalton Highway in a few different ways, but in my mind, the road falls into three distinct sections. The South Hall Road, the Brooks Range, the North Slope. The southern end of the Dalton Road is partly outside of the Arctic Circle, partly within. This section is about 175 miles and terrain-wise is very similar to the rest of central Alaska. It's characterized by steep rolling hills, and most of the elevation gain and loss for the route is in this section. In fact, this section has grades reaching up to 16%, making it the steepest highway I've ever been on. In particular, Beaver Slide really stands out. It's just below the Arctic Circle and is about a three mile climb at a consistent 14% grade. Pretty crazy, especially when the road turns to mud. Secondly is the Brooks Range portion. This section is about 100 miles long. This is characterized by the mostly gradual ascent up to Adigan Pass and then the descent down the north side of the Brooks Range. Adigan Pass, which is smack dab in the middle of this route, is the highest road pass in Alaska and therefore, of course, the highest point of this highway. The Brooks Range is the Continental Divide and is perhaps the most striking scenery of the trip. Because of the Brooks Range, this section also provides the most striking change in scenery of the trip, where the boreal forest gives way to the Arctic tundra. The final few miles on either side of Adigan Pass are very steep, but as was mentioned, most of the miles are either a gradual climb or descent. And on the southern edge of the Brooks Range, there's even a 35 mile stretch of excellently paved road. That takes us to our third and final section of the ride, the North Slope. This section is about 150 miles long. This is the least mountainous portion of the trip. With undulating hills of tundra and a practically flat final 50 miles to Prudhoe Bay. This though may be the most otherworldly section of the trip. While I was there, the tundra was fiery red for as far as the eye could see. The Brooks Range was faint in the distance, and the Sag River weaved its way along the road. It really felt like the edge of the earth. I've never been anywhere like it. Thirdly is the trucks. They aren't dangerous, they're good drivers, but you're going to have trucks going by you at 65, 70, 80 miles an hour on dirt roads. They're going to be kicking up all sorts of gravel, loose rocks, and you just gotta be prepared mentally for that. Bring some glasses, bring some goggles. My face got completely covered in mud on the day that I went over Adigan Pass. It rained all day and the trucks still have to go. They're working out at the oil field, pulling long days. So just be cognizant of that. Don't ride in the middle of the road. Use common sense. Also, if you ever need a ride from the truckers, they'll only give it to you if your life is in imminent danger. And this is for insurance reasons. So if your bike's broken, if you're feeling scared, a trucker is not going to pick you up. And they constitute the vast majority of traffic on the road. So go in with that knowledge. Four is the weather. As I noted, the day going over Adigan Pass was particularly bad, but it rained every single day that I rode. And where the road is dirt, which is most of it, there's this calcium sulfate material that they use, which makes it really nice when it's dry, but when it's wet, it gets extremely mucked up on the road. And it turns into a clay-like substance. So you run the risk while taking your bike on that of just completely clogging your gears, your chain, Anything that the mud gets on, it just makes for a mess. So I would suggest bringing a toothbrush, some sort of scrubber, and some lubricant. If I had had those things, my last day on the highway would have been a little bit better. And also, once you get closer to the Arctic Ocean, you're in what's called the polar vortex, which is basically one of the windiest places on Earth. 
The headwinds were absolutely brutal. They were 50 miles an hour when I was there. And that section is completely flat. I usually would be going 18 to 20 miles an hour, but I was only making five miles an hour at that point. So absolutely brutal. And it's just tundra out there. There's no way of getting out of the wind unless if you find a building of some sort, which are pretty few and far between. So what I would suggest is bringing a hard shell layer for rain, a warm down jacket that you always keep dry, and that hard shell rain layer can really help with wind protection. Because if you don't have that, your energy can really be sapped quickly. Depending on the time of year you go though, conditions can be a lot different. I rode during the shoulder season and peak fall, which is the rainiest time of year in the Dalton. In the months of June and July, there generally is way less rain, way less precipitation, and conditions are just easier in general. If you plan to go during winter though, you're probably pretty crazy. Think negative 40 with the polar vortex, with those 50 mile an hour winds. Just for reference, the record low temperature in US history was recorded on the Dalton at negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Specifically, the site is Prospector Creek. So just wanna put that in your brain it could get extremely cold in winter. Do your due diligence beforehand and send me a link. That would be pretty sick. And then lastly is the wildlife. On this road, you have the potential to see caribou, muskox, grizzly bear, polar bear, black bear, wolverine, moose, deer, porcupine, wolves, arctic hare, and a variety of different bird species. The muskox in particular were really amazing to see. They weigh about a thousand pounds and honestly look like an animal from Star Wars. They have big tusks, a shaggy coat, and they're really playful with one another. The male muskox would charge the group and they would all scatter around. It was totally playful. They weren't trying to hurt each other, but yeah, they were, they're just so cool to see. I didn't even know they existed until probably five years ago. And I think for a lot of people who didn't grow up in bear country, their biggest concern when doing a trip in Alaska are bears. But I just want to emphasize how unlikely it is that a bear will actually attack you, especially on this road. As you can see here in the Arctic, and to a lesser extent in the boreal forest south of the Brooks Range, there really isn't that much vegetation. So animals have to cover a massive range in order to get the food that they need. Therefore, populations of bears are pretty low throughout the region, and it's just unlikely that you'll run into a bear and have a negative encounter, especially if you're doing things right with regards to not cooking at your campsite and keeping food with you as you sleep. I would recommend bringing bear spray just in case, but again, I never used it. It does bring some peace of mind to have it at arm's length though while you're riding. So yeah, that pretty much sums up the five things that you should know before going on the Dalton Highway. One, the logistics of the trip. Two, the terrain. Three, the trucks. Four, the weather. And then lastly, is the wildlife. Riding this road was one of the greatest adventures that I've ever experienced. And I would highly recommend it if you come prepared and with the mindset that you're ready to take on this challenge. Having ridden this before, I have a pretty good grasp about what this road is like. And I'm more than happy to be a resource for any questions that you might have. So leave a comment. I'll get back to you right away. I've also lived in Northern Canada in winter, in fall, and in summer. So I have a pretty good grasp of what all the seasons are like. And I could definitely give you my two cents into what would make your trip the best. As always, I want to thank all my viewers, my subscribers for watching. I'm almost to a thousand, so pretty exciting. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. It'll help out my channel and you'll be able to see more educational, informative videos about destinations like this. Have a great day and happy adventures.